So I'm delighted to be here today uh, and um, to join you in the Maternity Festival. Um, it's a really lovely evening and I've really enjoyed Jenny's talk, which was, um, this is really going to follow on from that because I'm going to be talking tonight about the evidence behind self-care and also a bit about burnout. Um, okay, so recently I read a magazine article about self-care. And this article declared that self-care is the new diet industry. The article spoke about how marketers prey on people with promises of a better life if they subscribe to this or if they buy that. Perhaps marketing is caught on to self-care as a concept which can lure customers in, but that doesn't mean that the concept of self-care is not important. It seems to me that self-care may be almost trivialized as an indulgence. If you mention taking time out, it can result in eye rolling or be met with a sarcastic response. People might feel it's a luxury they just can't afford, but these beliefs need to be challenged. Self-care is essential for everyone. And whether you realize it or not, you probably practice self-care. And the World Health Organization recognized that self-care is essential for healthcare workers. And this document is available online. In 1985, in nursing, Orem developed the, the self-care theory and used this definition for self-care. And in 2013, the World Health Organization followed up with this definition of self-care, which is the ability of individuals, families and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health and to cope with illness with or without the support of a healthcare provider. In other words, without self-care, individuals lose the capability of maintaining their own health and well-being. And when this happens, we face burnout. But what is burnout? Burnout can happen gradually over a period of time, and it can be a response to a prolonged period of stress. It can be personal or work-related. A person might notice they have in difficulty sleeping, brain fog, irritability, and moodiness. Crucially, it affects the amygdala, which is the fear center in the brain, and this can affect problem solving and decision making. Therefore, burnout can not only affect midwife's personal well-being, but it might impact the quality of midwifery care. Since March 2020, midwives have faced unprecedented anxiety and stress related to working on the front line during the pandemic. COVID-19 presented an uncertain situation with little known about the virus and an evolving situation. Midwives continue to face work every day with the potential exposure to COVID, and we now face the second wave. As highlighted in the editorial in May, solidarity and compassion are vital. And the well-being of midwives must be a priority. We know that healthcare professionals, including midwives, are at risk, and sadly, some have died from COVID-19. Although more is known now about COVID and PPE is more readily available, anxiety around COVID is tangible and everyone is fatigued. Evidence from midwives working in the UK this year highlights the pandemic concerns for personal safety and well-being, fears for midwives' own family well-being, and the possibility of PTSD after COVID. In addition, the possible long-term impact of COVID on midwives and midwives also expressed moral distress since they could not provide the care that they wanted to for women. But even before the pandemic, stress, anxiety, depression and burnout levels were high in midwives working in the UK. The WELM study was conducted in 2017 and out of almost 2,000 midwives who participated, one third of midwives scored moderate and above for stress, anxiety and depression, and two thirds recorded moderate and above for work-related burnout. Crucially, 80% experienced personal burnout. And burnout was associated with being under the age of 40, having less than 10 years experience, having a disability or working in a hospital rotation midwife role. The RCM has developed this guidance to support midwives' emotional well-being in a pandemic in response to these findings. And there are three key elements which encompass this. The first is to recognise increased vulnerability to COVID-19. 
So recognizing that some midwives will have personal factors or individual characteristics that increase their vulnerability to COVID. The second is for managers to respond effectively to staff concerns. So facilitating trusting, open and non-judgmental relationships with managers. And thirdly, optimizing well-being. So ensuring that staff have access to PPE, ensuring adequate breaks, and uh, ensuring um, opportunities for well-being. So it's really important that uh, managers make time for socially distance or perhaps a virtual get team get together to boost morale. This guidance is available on the RCM website and there are some infographics which accompany the guidance and this can be downloaded and shared. The guidance highlights the need to keep compassion and care at the heart of the pandemic and that really came through in Jenny's presentation. I think she's very passionate about compassion that came through. Compassion applies to everyone involved in maternity care, from midwives, doctors, all maternity staff, as well as mothers, partners, and babies. And midwives are encouraged to remain calm and be the source of grounding for women, maintaining a, a calm environment. To do this, midwives must practice self-care. It's crucial that they take adequate breaks and eat and hydrate. The possible long-term impact of COVID-19 on midwives must be considered and there may be additional supports required by staff and students who are returning to practice. It's important to note that midwives did report some positive aspects of working during the pandemic. And this included an increased sense of pride in being a midwife, a sense of comradeship, creative freedom which led to innovations and care, more time to spend with women in the postnatal wards, and the fortitude to, to provide high quality midwifery care. They felt that they rose to the challenge and there was public acknowledgement of the value of their work. Still, if we take the results of the 2017 WELM study as a baseline prior to the pandemic, levels of stress, anxiety, depression and burnout urgently need attention in midwifery. Thus, self-care is to be endorsed and promoted for midwives' well-being. So what's the evidence in relation to self-care? A healthy diet sustains our energy levels and this leads to better moods. There's evidence to suggest that following a Mediterranean diet, which is based on the diets of people in Crete, Greece and south of Italy, and includes oily fish, whole grains, vegetables and fruits, can be a stress buster. This Irish team of researchers, they're called the New Gut Consortium, examined the relationship between our gut health and our mood, and they've had positive findings with fermented foods and prebiotic supplements. The advice is to avoid alcohol because it might, while alcohol may temporarily relieve stress, it's associated with anxiety and depression and might lead to a cycle of drinking to self-medicate. Increasing hydration is important because even mild cause irritability, headaches and moodiness. When we get stressed, we must slow down. This is usually the complete opposite of our intuition, which tells us to keep going to get a task done. In order to be able to think clearly and be innovative, we must take time out. And even a short break can reduce this stress, fatigue and improve focus. Meditation builds the grey matter in our cerebral cortex. With more practice, the more neural connections are formed, a process referred to as neuroplasticity, rather than degenerating the neurons form dense branches and connections. Yoga and meditation reduce cortisol levels, which rise when, when stressed. Activity in the amygdala might be reduced, resulting in an improved memory. There's ample evidence that aerobic exercise can also reduce depression symptoms and boost the memory and enhance well-being. And a good sleep is, a, is an essential component of self-care. Proper sleep can improve cognitive function, capacity for learning, and importantly, improve empathy. Research in the field of positive psychology has demonstrated that hope, optimism, gratitude, social connection and kindness are all crucial for our well-being. Finally, a sense of humour helps us to cope. Evidence suggests that laughter and humour improves anxiety and depression, relationship satisfaction, stress and pain. When a lot of us felt paralysed with anxiety in 2020, we re reacted by watching and sharing funny videos and memes with friends and family. Although as healthcare professionals, we should be cautious about sharing misinformation and fake news. So what can we do? 
We need to reframe the perception of self-care from a luxury or something we do when we have time to being a priority for our health and well-being. Self-care needs to be part of our daily routine. Check in with yourself and assess your mood regularly. Start by asking yourself, what can I do today to improve my mental and physical health? If you search for self-care in Google, the results will include treating yourself, getting spa treatments, facials. All of these things are nice, but self-care doesn't have to be expensive. Simple things can improve our well-being. And I think, again, Jenny showed that with her lovely walks and everything like that. And fragrance, Jenny, I liked that. I, I um, use fragrance a lot as well for a little pick-me-up. So key things that we can do are outlined here. Having a daily routine is extremely important. And when you're feeling a bit low, it can be difficult to, you know, to even think about getting up in the morning and all of these things. So having your daily routine, have your shower, brush your teeth um, and make an effort to kind of to look nice. It can boost your boost your uh, mood um, make sure you have fresh bed, sheets on your bed. Uh, improving your diet and hydration, cut down caffeine and sugar, increasing your water intake, all of those things. Practicing daily gratitude to wake you up in the morning and thinking of three things that you're thankful for today. Making time for exercise and time for, with friends and family, spending time in nature. Try to improve your sleep, although I know it's very, very difficult when you have anxiety. You need to listen to your body and when you need to take rest. And it's really important to look forward to the future and hold hope. At times, we might feel totally overwhelmed. And when this happens, grounding can help. Try to slow down your breathing and tune into your five senses. Five things you can see. Four things you can hear. Three things you can touch. Two things you can smell. And one thing you can taste. Try to live in the present moment and hold hope for the future. It might help to take a, a break from the news or social media, as the news can be especially intense at the moment. Try to switch off by reading a book. And if you're struggling, take action for your well-being. Reach out and ask for help. And the NHS has a well-being support line, which is open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily. You can text Frontline to 85258 or phone 03001317000. So some things that I found useful. Um, so I've always used journaling and self-reflection throughout my life. And when the pandemic kind of hit back in March, April, I thought, what can I do to help my students? Because I was acutely aware that, um, you know, they had needs for their well-being. So I suggested to my second year nursing students that um, I would help them to reflect and blog and journal. And so I had a small group of students join me. And this is what, one of my students, Louisa Fernandez, who got published in the Nursing Times. So a couple of my students got published, um, Mariam and Mahmoud and Abir. And um, Louisa wrote this lovely uh, blog about the barriers that she faced during quarantine and how she um, overcame them. She spoke about using the Pomodoro technique for study so that's a really nice blog that's available on the Nursing Times. And I think by doing this, we really felt part of the global community as well. You know, we weren't so isolated and alone. It kind of connected everybody in that sense. So it was a really positive thing that we did um, during, the, during the pandemic that was back in uh, April, May. Other things that I found useful are getting active, same as Jenny. So cycling around Bahrain in the evenings, I would go and try and catch the sunset and just meditate by the sea, which was nice. And um, other things I found useful are listening to music, singing, you know, if you're feeling a bit down, why not go into the kitchen, turn on a good song and have a nice dance and just try and get your energy levels up by whatever song, you know, you feel like listening to. Um, yoga, I did my yoga teacher training during lockdown and it's something that I've always relied on um, when for keeping my stress levels down. And um, so I'm hoping to share some of that with you this evening as well. Baking, I think a lot of people uh, embrace baking during uh, lockdown and during this year. Staying in contact with my friends and family, although socially distant. And it's really important to connect with systems of social support. Family video calls are now a normal part of our lives. Plenty of laughter, love and support. If I'm feeling stressed, sometimes it might be work related. And if it is, it can be helpful to get organised and get things done or make a plan to, to get things done. I love lists and find great satisfaction crossing things off. 
And when you do cross them off, you experience a sense of relief. <laughs> Self-care is not just taking time out, as Jenny said as well. It's ensuring you maintain your emotional, physical, psychological and spiritual health. So in conclusion, self-care is an essential part of life. It's not a luxury you can't afford. We need to schedule self-care into our daily lives. It doesn't have to be an expensive spa treatment or treat, but rather simply self-compassion by taking good care of yourself and allowing yourself to rest, to laugh and enjoy yourself and spend time with friends and family. This is an unprecedented time which calls for unprecedented kindness. And I know it's cliche, but it's so important in these times to be kind and not just to others, but to yourself. This is especially important for midwives since compassion is crucial for the provision of respectful maternity care. In the words of Pema Children, compassion for others begins with compassion for ourselves. Um, and there are some references there, which I think Sue is going to put up on the website and you can consult afterwards. Um, and then later, if you feel like it, I would like to invite you to meditate with me. I'll be doing a guided meditation after the session. Um, and I don't think I mentioned my Twitter handle. If you wanted to tweet me on Twitter at the lovely maze. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.